All right, well, let's just pray and get this thing underway. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, that, that you love us. Lord, we want to thank you that you pour out your Spirit on us, Lord God, to strengthen us, to empower us, Lord God, to give us wisdom, to be motivated, Father God, to share your love with other people. Because that's really what it's all about. Father, I ask that you would just open every eyes... Open every heart in this place today, Lord God. I pray that there would just be a spirit of healing that would just cover us today. Father, as we worship you in song, in prayer, and in the word, Father, I pray that you would just heal broken hearts. Mend us back together, Lord. That's what you do. You take the broken pot and you piece it back together. You take the raw clay and you form it. Lord, just form us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we love you, and we thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yeah, we had, uh, we had this, this room filled with, with tables uh, yesterday, so the worship team didn't get to practice, but thank God for videos, you know it. I mean, it's good for them to get a break every now and then, and it's also good for us to be able to just have a little bit of change of pace. So, God is good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, for those of you that are that are new, uh, we uh, this is a time where we we take the opportunity for the to, to share uh, what the Lord has been doing in our lives. If we have testimonies and things like that, um, this this young man here gets his steps in for the week, and. Uh, and passes the microphone around. So, anybody have anything that they'd like to share? God been moving in any powerful ways? I want to thank the Lord for all that has, He has done, you know. And I know I was just up there and reading what He was saying. Like they were singing. The Lord, and things works together for His good, you know. I mean, you already know the things I went through. And now... As I went through the whole situation, I called it my tribulation time or something like that because, you know, you know all about my brother, and now he's doing good. Everything mm. seems to be falling into place, you know, and, good. and here I am, you know. I'm like, Lord, what is all this, you know? You know, as a man, you know, I'm macho, and i am got everything I need. I want to go off and go to war with against the enemy. But the Lord told me, he said, no, let me, vengeance is mine, and... I've sent all these people to you to get your attention, you know, because mm -hmm. I know you, and you <laughs> want to go out there and fight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, so now I'm stuck, and, you know, and I learned how to listen to God. And like it says, all things work for the good. Mm -hmm. We have to go through all these problems in order to, the Lord teach us to open our eyes, uh, you know, because sometimes we got tunnel vision, and we just want to fight. Mm -hmm. But then after we, it's all done and said, the Lord reveals to us why he had to teach us from that mistake. Or Amen. To learn. I had to learn how to not just lash out and fight, mm -hmm. which I was. We all know that these things, as men think, is these things are the one that has settled the business, you know. But when you try Jesus, he does a more better job. Yeah, he does, doesn't I he? Just think, I just thank God that I'm here. I'm going to graduate, and I'll be still around, and uh, I'll be still doing, and I have every intentions, I believe where my heart lies is going out to the highways and byways and telling people that do not know Jesus, you know, about the Lord, and yesterday, after you left, after we ate breakfast, something, Jesus put on my heart to pray for an unknown person on a motorcycle named Charlie going to Southwest Carolina. And when I told you I'm going to step out in faith and do it instead of just reasoning in my mind, mm -hmm. I've done it. So we all got around, Glenn, me, Chris, and stuff, and we all prayed for that guy. And I saw him. Was, yeah. And I'm like, okay, Lord, but I'm just not standing here and going to blow my trumpet and screaming hard and say, look at me, I've done this, you know. <laughs> no, I don't care. I don't care what my left hand or my right hand is doing. You know, all I do is just do what Jesus says. Amen. I'm starting to learn to step out in faith. Because he has saved my brother. Everything that I know now is falling into place. You know, I'm like, oh, man, you know. 
everybody's I know or going to church and everything. I'm like, wow, man. I mean, <laughs> I can't even possibly imagine you know, what's happening, but I know something good is going to happen, and I know God hasn't given up on me, and I'm just here until he completes his purpose in me. I don't know what it is. You said it, but you're keeping it from me, so I, I'll just keep it at that, you know. <laughs> but thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? There we go. The one with the pink hair. <laughs> yeah, right. Hopefully he's not colorblind. <laughs> um, so uh, they made the announcement this week that they have found somebody to interview for my position. So um, I'm excited for that to start um God's calling for me to be home with my kids and my husband. And um, <clears throat> something that uh, I was listening to a preacher say was that in our obedience, that sometimes it's a blessing for somebody else. So I'm just praying that in my obedience that this is a blessing for this person that's going to um, come after me yeah. and take my place and that it's going to yeah. be the answer to their prayers. So. Amen. Amen. That's that's exactly right. I like that. You know, that it's, it's a well-paying job, but you realize in your life that it's not about money. It's about what God's asked you to do, but there might be somebody else that really needs a well-paying job. And so they get, yeah, I'm praying for that too. That's, that's awesome. Anybody else? Elaine? She we got chairs missing? They went somewhere. Huh? Oh. Okay. Uh, you know, you could sit with this one of these days. I, I, I always thought that that was like because Bill, you know, was wearing the mask and you could join this someday. <laughs> right? They don't, nobody gets kicked when they're worshiping God. Go ahead, Jason. Um, most people don't know this. I had back injuries really bad 30 plus years ago. It's lower back, so it doesn't recover ever, quite honestly. It just never recovers. And then throughout my various jobs that I've had, I've moved furniture, appliances, a lot of heavy lifting by myself, then sending for almost 10 years on concrete floors in one spot. Takes a major toll on the back. It's really horrible. Um, then I spent the past 10 and a half years in air-conditioned comfort, in a chair, not having to be up all the time, and not use my back a whole lot and with my new job I get to use my back because if we do not only we mowing out at the cemetery we do weed eating we have three mowers down we have five employees out there during the summer and so that puts our two seasonal workers mowing just mowing all summer long that's what they're doing so I got to do a lot of weed eating the past couple of weeks and my back's been great <laughs> Amen. It should not have been, but it's been great. God's taking care of me. So. That's all. Amen. <laughs> I just wanted to share with you, you know, about my son. It's been hard. Thursday was his birthday, and I couldn't hardly breathe all day. But I kept saying, I can do this, I can do this. But I knew in my heart what replaces the birthday here on earth. The day that he, God called him home, which was March the 30th of 1960, or March the 30th, 23. <laughs> and that's his new birthday up in heaven. Amen. 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 That's the way to look. We don't die. If we, if we know Jesus, we don't die. We just move on to the next stage. Anybody else? Can I, can I um, give a prayer request? Okay. Uh, Ethan, who went to the movie w with us mm -hmm, the other night, mm -hmm. his mom passed away Friday. Mm. He's got twin sisters who are in elementary school and a teenage sister. So if there's, you know, if you would just keep it in your heart to pray for him, he's not responsible. And he is a responsible young man. There's no dad around? But the grandparents are there, and they have aunts. They do have pretty strong family, but, you know, 
this young man is, is now head. And he told his mom he would take care of his sisters. So um, he's fixing up the house that she bought and everything. So if we could just keep him in prayer and maybe Absolutely. if God lays it on your heart to help him, that would be great. Yeah. Let's lift him up in prayer right now. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we want to thank you that, that you've entrusted us with the opportunity to know the situation. And Father, when you, when, you, when you bring these things to us, it's not just so we can smack our lips and shake our head and say, that's terrible. It's so that we can lift this young man up in prayer, Father God, so that we can ask for angels to surround him each and every day. Father, we pray that you would just strengthen this young man. Lord, we pray that there would not be any hopelessness that would, that would enter in. Father God, you've got a plan for his life, and it does not matter what happens around him, Father. I pray that you would just put people in his life that would share this information with him, that would let him know that it's, it's, it's all part of the plan. It really is. Lord, you call people home sometimes out of the blue. And so, Lord, right now, we just ask that you would give us wisdom as a church body to know how to respond to this, to know how to, to, to help Ethan in any way. Father, he's going to need some, some help in the coming days. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Lord, we pray that Ethan would know your love. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Melissa. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, I guess, Rhonda, I guess his, I didn't realize it, but his mother's my cousin. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, she's been sick for a while. Yeah. She's been very um, passive about it, you know? Yeah. hate cancer. James? Well, I, I just had to say, I wasn't here last week, uh, and I wanted to be for the men's uh, breakfast, but there were some stones put in my way. But you know, the Lord has my back, and I just have to go with the black. He was saying, you have to be obedient, you have to go when you're supposed to go, and when you don't. Amen. And I was really inspired when I see your congregation I've been to other churches and visited, but you have a mixed group. You're struggling together, uh, and you seem to be very genuine in your love. And that's what the Holy Spirit, that's what the Lord was saying. He's working in my heart. said, that's what they need to overcome and to get together and work those things out. That's what he wants. He doesn't want one over here and one over there. And you yeah. Better than them. So, you know, I was really impressed when I see this. You know, that people actually uh, have fellowship and are struggling together. That's what he wants. Amen. Amen. You know, from the day I walked through this door, James, I, from the day that I walked through the door as a pastor, I have, I have pushed that we are all one in Christ Jesus. You know, and uh, even though the world out here is trying to separate us, in here, we're one in Christ Jesus. And the goal is, is to carry that outside these doors. Amen. Anybody else? Ah, there we go. Uh, I got two things. Um, I just want to thank God for giving me the strength to uh, get through this work week that I just had because um, it was kind of hard on me because I had other things like my stress going on outside of work and uh, it just I don't know but I thank God that he got me through it because I got I'm not trying to like speak about financial things because I'm still struggling but I had the biggest check that I've had working this week and I gave it I thank God for it because I didn't have the strength I was in my head a lot and uh, thank him for that for sure but uh, amen another thing is one of my close friends I wouldn't even say close but uh in high school, he was like somebody that just made me laugh, always had a good time anytime I seen him, and uh, he passed away mm. a few days ago. His mm. name's Taryn Morrison, and uh, mm. if you could just, pr every, anybody, if they could just pray for him, uh, I'd appreciate it, because I don't want him, I want him to know that he was loved when he was down here, and he was a good person towards me and the people that uh, he actually 
was around. Everybody knows him as being a funny guy and outgoing and just ready to have a good time. And it's so sad that he has his life taken away. His name's Taryn. Well, let's pray for his family right now. Lord, we just, we just lift up the family of Taryn to you, Lord. Lord, if, if David went to school with him, that means that this was just a young man. And Father, sometimes we don't understand why, why young men and women are taken. But Lord, it's not our job to understand. It's our job to love people. And so, Father, I just ask right now that you would send a horde of people, a herd, a, a gathering of people to surround this family, to lift them up, show them the love of Christ. Father, I ask for strength in all of these, these young men, this, this man's friends, this young man's friends. And Lord, I pray that you would use this, this situation to show all of these young men and women that knew him, that cared for him, that you're never promised tomorrow. All you have is today. And today is the day that the Lord has made. Father, I pray that there would be none of these kids that would wait another day to give their life to you. Father, you take unspeakable tragedies and you turn it into miracles. And so that's what we just declare right now, that you're going to use this situation, Father, to turn the hearts of these young people towards you. Father, we thank you that you're a good God and you never waste anything. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Anybody else? <laughs> I was waiting. I was kind of looking over there here every now and then. Right? I just want to say that I fell and relapsed a while back, um, and I've been gone for four months now in California in a sober living house. And last time I quit doing drugs, but I didn't quit drinking, and that was one of the main things that I needed to stop. It was one of the worst enemy, and I didn't even know it. And so I have quit drinking, quit smoking cigarettes, quit doing drugs, got four months clean under my belt, doing great. Keep doing it too. <laughs> Amen. We, <laughs> we've been keeping in contact and, and talking on the phone and stuff here and there, and, and uh, I knew they were out in California doing real good. And so I was wondering if they were going to come back. They was living in sunny, you know, Southern California around the Los Angeles area. And well, just keep that sobriety going. You know, I used to think that I had to leave here in order to get sober. That wasn't it. What I had to, what, what the answer was is really wanting to get sober. Because if you really want to, then you'll just get sober. It doesn't matter where you're at. And so I, I was right here. Went, went to Dallas, you know, for three years to get sober and wind up doing a year sentence. Right? And then whenever I get out, I'm here and I got sober. I got sober here right where I grew up. The very place that I had all the opportunities to not get sober, I got sober because Christ was in my heart. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. I, know, I remember sitting here six months ago saying, I'm not ever going to get rid of my alcohol. I'm never going to get rid of my weed. You know what I mean? And, and every single one of them is starting to go away from me. It's not even bothering me anymore. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hey, man, it's one thing at a time, brother. I'm telling you. I quit, too. I'm telling you, when I wake up, I still want to eat one or two. You want to eat one or two, huh? Maybe just kind of stick it in your lip and chew on a little bit. <laughs> Hey, I, I, I understand. I understand. It, it's, it's a battle. All right. Anybody else? I just want, oh, hello. <laughs> Good morning. I was just wanting to say that I have been uh, clean for over 30 some years, and I'm glad to be here. Amen. And I love yeah. the Lord. <laughs> You know, I I just found out this last week who who you who you're related to. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, I didn't realize you were related to to Ernie and yeah. Olitha. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That's they, my sister and brother. Yeah. They started the ARC, which is where we have our ministry, where we go on Thursdays. And I hate cancer. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hmm. Same here. A lot of them, anyway. Can you go? Go for it. <clears throat> so, I had surgery, hernia repair surgery, about a week and a half ago. And the recovery has not been so great. <laughs> not so much because of the actual surgery, but because I've been dealing with a lot of coughing since the surgery. And it's been so bad. Like, it just hurt so much every time I coughed. And um, I came last week, and I received prayer. And things were going pretty good. I got a little comfortable. <laughs> And my mother-in-law and I ventured off and done a little more than I should have, I think. And so Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I was just feeling awful. And I wasn't going to be here today. I had already asked my husband to stay home with me, and he said yes. And um, at 3 in the morning, the Lord woke me up, and he said, you have to be there. And <laughs> we've all suffered loss here recently. Um, and I've lost several people within the span of a year. Um, but I remember God brought to my heart our dear, beloved Santa, Bill, <laughs> who we just lost. And he was suffering with cancer for a long time. And his body was in pain. And I don't know how God gave him the strength to come every Sunday. He made the commitment to be here, even suffering through the pain. He actually came last December as Santa to be Santa for our littles. And I have a precious picture of it, the whole thing. And I remember seeing him just so broken and hurting. And I went home and cried. And I I told my husband, I said, I don't even know why he was there. But his love for God and for his family, that's what brought him here. And I said to myself, if Bill, having terminal cancer and all that pain in his body, came here every week to serve and to worship God, then I can do it too. So I just want to encourage you to come. It doesn't matter what comes your way, what you're dealing with through the week. If you can get up and take the steps out of your home to get in your car and drive here, come. Because God has something for you. It's those times that you think you can't make it and that you're hurting and that you need to stay home. It's those times that God has something for you. So Amen. I know today God has something for us. Amen. You know, and actually, I just realized Glenn and Sharon aren't here. They were? Oh, okay. I guess maybe it's something that come up. Huh? Hmm. Okay. Well, we're going to tell him this doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, for you guys that don't know, Glenn is 77 in the last I think like like 56 years, he's only missed 8 Sundays. Yeah, so I'm telling him. Mm -mm. So this one don't count, Glenn. <laughs> oh, all right. Anybody else? All right, well, then uh, let's welcome Levi to the stage. Amen. What? Yeah. We got Will? Oh, 
Come on up, buddy. Let's pray for you right quick. Could somebody get that? Yeah, don't kick it. Just could you pick it up? Both of them? Sorry, brother. <laughs> <coughs> Will's had a, a neck injury that's taken place a while back, and I guess the doctors are looking at it and and they're saying different things about it. And you know, we'd obviously don't want him to have to have surgery. And uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, Will, but uh, there's been some research that's been done lately, and cell phones are really tough on our necks because we bend our heads down and we're staring at them. So uh, I just want to encourage you, man. I, I mean, I don't have any clue what you do with your cell phone. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm just saying I just want to encourage you to look up. Amen. Look up to heaven, buddy. You know you are surrounded by people that love you. You've had some ups and you've had some downs and you had some ins and outs and we've always been here for you and we always will be here for you because we love you and I'm just grateful that you're here today Father we just ask right now and you're in the name of Jesus that you would b begin to restore this young man's body Father he's too young to be dealing with, with, with problems that deal with his spine Father, we need healing right now in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, we ask that you would just repair all of the things that might be out of place or out of alignment, Lord God, or broken or, or torn or whatever it may be. Lord, we just believe that this man has a, a strong future ahead of him because it's founded on the rock. Lord, I pray that he would never look to the left or the right again. Lord, sometimes... Sometimes we may peak, but you know what? You're there, you're faithful, and you lift us back up. Lord, I pray that we would always be here for him. I pray, Lord, that whenever he falls, we would be there to lift him up and dust him off. And it's not in our strength that we would do those things. It's in Christ's strength. Father, we just pray a blessing over his life. We pray a blessing over his mother, who is here today as well. And Lord, we pray for strength in both of them, to step into everything that God has called them to. Lord, we don't have loss and pains and things like that in our life and it just be wasted. What it means is that you've got a big destiny for them. Lord, give them the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to step into the destiny that you've designed for them. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hi. I'm going to go ahead and use my uh, real Bible today. My real Bible, not the digital one. Yeah, you get it. You guys ready for the only like happy part of this? I'm wearing white pants because as of tomorrow, they say I can't. I'm still gonna. But they say I can't. You know why I'm still gonna, though? It's actually not because they told me I couldn't and I'm disobedient that way because I don't work that way. It's, it's actually because we all know that this is Oklahoma, and September doesn't mean fall temperatures. It just means the summer temperatures that everybody else was saying was too hot. So, like, I'm probably going to still wear my white pants. I, uh, you know, sometimes... God wants to talk to you through preaching. Sometimes God wants to talk to you through teaching. Sometimes he wants to talk to you through somebody else's experience. And he's going to do a little bit of all of those, I guess, today. A little bit of preaching, a little bit of experience. This is deeply personal to me. Um, everybody's probably got stories like this, but I do believe that God has something for all of us today. And uh, I believe that there are layers to this. I believe that there's going to be stuff that you catch today, and then there's going to be stuff that you catch tomorrow, and then there's going to be stuff that you catch on Wednesday. 
as we keep going. But I went ahead, uh, I was in the shower, and I was thinking about this, and God gave me the title, and it was uh, Good Grief. Um, I think that's funny because <laughs> I actually watched my dad get tased once. Yeah. <laughs> You know what he said? You know what his reaction was to getting tased? He's lying there on the floor and he goes, Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> I know that what I would have said wouldn't have been able to be recorded. Um, but not dad. So good grief. Um, I was going to bring the banjo today so that you'd have to look at it, but, but you, you don't because I didn't want to leave it in the car. Uh, some of you know, I, th those of you who have been here longer know that I used to have a YouTube channel, um, and my dad was my cameraman for that YouTube channel, and we traveled all over everywhere that we could, and uh, um, we made these videos, but by last fall, God had showed me that my priorities had gotten out of line. It wasn't that the channel was bad or wrong. It was that my priorities had gone sideways, and they needed to be fixed. And I needed to come back up here to, to play for God first, and then for man, you know, but God first, right? Um, and so with those priorities there, I had set the channel to the side um, by that fall, and because of that, I didn't notice something. I didn't notice something that had happened. And I didn't find out about this until recently. But it was weird because when my father passed, Jonathan kept, I mean, it was like, like his way of checking in on me was going, are you still playing that banjo? I thought, no. I mean, why would I be? I'm not doing the channel anymore, right? That, that was simple. But he kept doing it almost every time. He's like, don't quit playing that banjo. And I thought, at, at the time, I just thought he was trying to be supportive. But, but now I realize that, that God was trying to tell me something, and I wasn't quite hearing it. Um, and even when we were working on getting stuff ready for my new school, for those of you that don't know, the last two weeks have looked nothing like the previous 11 years of my life. Nothing is the same. None of it. It... There is not one piece of my life that is normal, and, uh, and I'm enjoying it, but the past is literally gone. <laughs> I mean, I've got nothing to hold on to, you know, I'm just, I'm just blindly aiming at the future. But, um, but we were talking about what name to put on my stuff and everything, and my wife was like, well, why don't you put Ozark Benjamin on there? And I said, no, and she looked at me and she said, what happened? And I didn't know until somebody donated a banjo. And since, you know, as the resident only guy that knew about banjos that I knew of in this church, I was like, I'll clean it up. I'll, I'll get it in tune for you. I'll, I'll, I'll make it nice and pretty. And, and I'll get people interested so they can buy raffle tickets for it. And so I cleaned it up. And then I played it. <laughs> it hurt so bad. I didn't know why. I had a minute during my planning period, and I just happened to look at my old channel. And it drained every bit of happiness out of me. Not joy, because that doesn't get to go. That's, that's Jesus's, and that stays. But every bit of happiness I had was gone. For the rest of that day, all I wanted to do was go to sleep. And I realized... that I had not let go of something that I needed to let go of and that I had not allowed God to heal an area that he wanted to heal. We're going to keep going into that, but I want you guys to know something about grief, particularly about peace. Peace doesn't mean ignoring the past for the sake of moving on. That's not what peace is. Peace is seeing the past 
and it not destroying you. In Joshua 4.7, I put all of this way out of order, I apologize. In Joshua 4.7, we actually have the Israelites, and they're fighting. And, uh, and after they fight, they, this battle, God instructs them to build this tower of rocks. Hey guys, go get a pile of rocks. That way, when everybody sees it, um, they'll remember what God did. Right? And that was called an Ebenezer, and that, that's actually a different one. This one is when they crossed the Jordan River. Now, we all know that the Jordan River is the point that they didn't get to go back from. There was no Egypt after the Jordan River. Um, when they crossed that, he said, I want you to stack up 12 stones here too. And they're remembering stones. And he says, right here, he says, let me see. Tell them that the flow of the Jordan, this is when people ask, what those rocks there for, right? It says, tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. God doesn't have a problem with memorials. I've got one right here. This is my Ebenezer. Not Scrooge, that's, what it's, that's Hebrew for memory rock. When people ask, they say, hey, where'd you get that? I get to say, my dad gave it to me. And by the way, before he was sick. So this one's a little bit more special than some of the other things I got after he was sick because I knew why he was giving those to me. And that was less fun for me. Um, but you know what? Something about those memorial stones... They're always built in the wilderness. I never thought about what that meant before. It means you don't get to live there. You don't build these memory stones in your house because they'll destroy you, because you can't look forward. So understand that your peace in grief is not just trying to ignore it or pretend it didn't happen. What I was doing, what I had done is I locked the banjo away in my head so that I didn't have to remember I don't have a cameraman anymore. You can't do that. You can't. You've got to allow yourself to see the stones and say, I remember that. And yeah, it probably means you're going to look like this a lot. A lot. You know, I thought about what, what that looks like with us. And I thought, you know, I, I spent a lot of my life really not understanding what God looked like. A lot of my life. Man, I saw God one way. I mean, and I, I, uh, I'm glad he's not that. I'm glad he's not what I saw. Because what I saw was always a little mad at me and always trying to pressure me to do things that I, I needed to be doing. And, you know, he was, he was kind of a jerk. And that's not God at all. So what I want us to do right now, here's where the teaching preaching part is, and then I want to get back to my experience, because I think that there's something for everybody here, not because I think that my experience is so great, but because when I had this experience, I had the demanding desire to share. And to me, that says that God wants to bless you guys with this too, but we've got to learn something. What, what does God look like in this situation? When you're sitting there and you're like, God, it hurts. It hurts. I don't know how to move right now. What does God look like there? So before I do this, I want you guys to know I'm going to be using two Hebrew words. Here. Well, three, let's be technical. Three Hebrew words here that are controversial. Now, what that means is, we're not 100% sure what their meaning is. There's options, right? Now, 
don't assume, and I wanted to take a minute to teach this, because me up here saying that there are words in the Bible that we don't know what they mean 100% does not remove an iota of the legitimacy of the Bible or the people teaching it. It does not. That's not how language works. And I'm a linguist. I teach Spanish. It's, it's actually what I do. I promise you that's not how language works. Just because we're not 100% sure what it means doesn't mean that it is vacant or means nothing, right? If I asked you in English, what does turn mean? Everybody kind of, right? No, I meant turn up. No, I meant turn down. No, I meant turn in. No, I meant turn out. So what does turn mean? Oh. It depends on what preposition you attach to it, right? That doesn't mean that if I say turn, that there's no validity to what I'm saying. It just means I, I don't really know how to put a finger on what that means exactly, right? I just want us to understand that. So we're going to talk about one of the names of God for a second because we're going we're gonna to really see an example of how God looks during this, this situation, during this feeling, because I want you, when you're at home, when you're dealing with your losses, when you're dealing with your losses, when you're dealing with your losses, and when you guys are, uh, all four of you back there, because I know we're here, I want you to know what God's doing in that moment so that you don't have to wonder or get it wrong. The way that God identified himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not Yahweh. That's not, he didn't say that until Moses. Now, Moses continues to use that name because, all through the writing because he's the one writing the books, and he knows his name. When God came to Abraham, he said, I am El Shaddai. He didn't say that I am Yahweh, not yet. He said, I am El Shaddai. So, give me a second. Okay. So, what does El Shaddai translate to? Well, most of your Bibles translate it to the Almighty. That is highly controversial. In fact, at this point, we're actually starting to move completely away from that translation. It's not because it's a bad translation. It's because it's not 100% accurate. Um. There are two scholars on this. Oh, nope, sorry, there's not. Um, there are two schools on this. One is that Shaddai actually means protector. That's why it's written on the mezuzah, that thing that Hebrew people put on their door that they touch every time they go in and out. They actually put it either just Sh or Shaddai completely on that. And it means protector because God is protecting us. So when he first comes to Abraham, the first guy that he truly, truly reveals himself to, he says, I'm your protector, I'm here to help. The other option is um, shadda, which is literally that same word, actually means chest. So shaddai means, I am my chest. Now, I know that sounds weird, but no, it doesn't, because where do you go when you're hurting? You go to the chest, right? Mama's chest. And I know that sounds weird because we're like, but God's a guy. No, God is the defining creator of the entire universe. If you want to put him into male or female, you're kind of missing it, right? He is 100% everyone you need him to be. So where do we go? The chest. So he goes to Abraham and he says, hey, bring it in, buddy. I'm the chest. Right? I've got two verses here to read. And the first one you might not catch. The second one will tie it together, I promise. This is Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 12. For the Lord's portion is his people. Portion means inheritance, by the way. So God actually considers us his inheritance, which if you think about that in legal terms, that's pretty cool. <laughs> he actually wants us. <laughs> Sorry. 
For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him, and he cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them on his pinions. Opinions are the flying feathers on the wing. I didn't, I didn't know that. I had to look that up this morning. You know what I'm talking about. When all those babies are in the nest and they're just screaming and the bird just puts his wings over them. Right? That's what it is. Here's the blanket for you. Right? God described himself as a mother bird covering up his little babies with a blanket. Now, before you catch where I'm, uh, the word El Shaddai not being there, Psalms 91, 1 through 4, says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High and will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, the Shaddai, What's the shadow then? It's the wings. It's the wing shadow. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You'll see there's two gods being discussed here. It's the same God, but there's two sides to this. That's very common in the Bible. You tell two stories completely differently, but they're about the same thing. And when we talk about my experience later, you're going to see God did that with me. That was one of the reasons I knew it was from him and not somebody else. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, and my God is whom I trust. Right? The first thing he says is God is, right? He's the walls. He's the fort. He's the helm's deep for the Lord of the Rings fans out there. Yeah. Right? But then he says, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You see, it's, it's still just God. He is both the walls, but he's also inside the wall saying, it's okay, pop up. It's okay. You're safe. I don't, I don't really see a a God here that is annoyed that you don't feel it today. Do you? Keeping this focused, right? I don't see a God that's like, yeah, you've cried enough, buddy. Did you know that God sits with me when I am bawling about the loss of my dad, and my dad is sitting in his presence right now? Do you realize that God is looking right at my dad right there? But he cares enough about my feelings <laughs> to sit with me and say, it's okay, I know it hurts. How many of us as parents, I mean, be honest right now, be honest, how many of us are that good of a dad? No, if we know that what our kid is upset about isn't that big a deal, we're just like, toughen up, buttercup. That's not God. It doesn't matter in the slightest to my Father in heaven that he's looking at my dad and he knows he's doing just fine. I miss my dad. And God's willing to sit with me and cover me with those wings. El Shaddai is with me. It's like, it's okay, buddy. So don't feel like you have to just hop right back up. And we all do it. When we think about grief, everybody wants to bring up, yeah, but he's in God's presence. Yeah, but good coming. Yeah, but I know. I'm a Christian, but it hurts now. When, you, when, when we do that to each other, all you're doing is putting me into a situation where I have to realize I'm in the wrong. But I'm not. God doesn't say I'm in the wrong. He says, it's okay, buddy, hurt. Let it out. It's okay that right now, I may know where my dad is, but I don't feel good about it right now. And that's okay. 
The other word that we have a problem with, <laughs> sorry, my language there, is Pesach. And this one's huge because it's the word for the Passover. So this is kind of a big deal. We say that Pesach means to pass by or over something. In other words, Pesachti, I passed it, right? But there's controversy here and a lot. And I think that what we're going to find is we are very wrong here. Um, his name was Targum Onkelos, and he was alive in the seventh, uh, second century. So long, long time ago. But he was an Aramaic and Hebrew scholar. And he actually translated the word Pesach to, to take pity on or have pity with somebody. Dr. Gary Pratico, who has written the most current everybody uses textbook on biblical Hebrew, says that it actually means more like to hover or to cover. Remember our eagle that hovers over his nest? Now we're just going to actually read this and we're going to see if maybe they're not right. So I gave one verse to Shane, and I kept the other to myself. That wasn't on purpose. But the first one is Exodus 12, 13. Exodus 12, 13. This is the Passover. This is where this word occurs in the Bible. He says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will Pesach, right? And no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, you'll notice here it doesn't say and no. But in Hebrew, that's actually one sentence. He says, I will Pesach and no destruction will fall on you. Okay? If you have your real Bibles, if you go just 10 verses forward to verse 23, Moses will tell what God said. Now, both are correct, right? Don't, don't do that to yourself. Don't start doubting the validity of the Bible. But listen to this. And this one I'm actually not going to read in my Bible. I'm going to read it through a Hebrew interlinear. I am not going to butcher the pronunciation to read it to you in Hebrew. It wouldn't matter anyway. But I'm going to read the translation word for word, okay? It says, For I will pass through, or for God will pass through to strike Egypt, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, Upasach, he will pass, Yahweh, God will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. There's two spirits moving around Egypt that night. There's the destroyer and there's God. Now let me ask you a question. Is this an effective strategy? Oh, blood. Hey, don't hit him. Is that an effective strategy? See how pass doesn't work. This definition of pass doesn't work. But have pity does, and so does hover over. See, it's not God saying, eh, they'll leave that house alone. It's God saying, this is the house, right? We got the metaphor? Yeah. Leave the house alone. He will not let the destroyer enter. Once again, God is a coverer, a big old blanket. He protects us, but not like in the you know, I got a sword and I'll stand in front of you way. He protects us in the, I'm going to cover you with me way. So let's see how this all plays out, right? If God is this wing covering, loving, protecting, pitying mother bird, when I am sitting there saying, God, it hurts, what is he doing? First Kings. 
you've probably all heard this story, but I want you guys to allow God to say something new with it. Um, sometimes when you mention a verse to me that I've read a million times, I have to fight myself to remember that even if I read it a million times, God would still have something new to say. So don't hear this. Hear this, okay? 1 Kings 19, 1 through 9. Now, Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I, will do, will, I do not make your life like that of one of them. In other words, she threatened to kill him. And Elijah left. And Elijah suffered what we all pretty much agree is depression is some, some bad grief. There's good grief and there's bad grief. He suffered some bad grief. When you hear what he says here, I just want you to think about it and tell me how many times you haven't said something like this. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey. I just want to be alone. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed there, or prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough, Lord. I've had enough. He said, Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. I felt that when I checked out my channel. I had a really good cameraman, guys. Like, you don't even know. Like, he, he really was. After he had slept for a while, it says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate it, and he drank it, and he went right back to sleep. You see the security blanket? Do you see God the security blanket? When you're there, he's not saying, get up, do something with your life. He's saying, get up, I made you breakfast. I just need you to eat. And then after that, it says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. Dang, I feel that. I feel that. I have felt that since last fall. The journey is too much for you. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Don't you, don't you hate it when people say God will never give you more than you can handle? The journey is too much for you. Forget what God's putting on it. The journey's too much for you. That's why God is awesome. Because he'll carry you. That's what he does. So he sits with Elijah and he covers him and he protects him and he keeps him safe. So when I go home tonight and I let out a real good cry because I don't feel it right now, God is not sitting there with me saying, all right, puppy, let's get up. He's saying, I'm right here. Here's your blanket. Here's your beaks for the, for the, the Mexican ladies in here. Little, little beaks for your nose. And I've, I've heated you up some nice cakes, and I've given you some nice water. So just sit here and cry, and that's okay. That's what God looks like. He doesn't look like something else. He actually loves you. Just sit there and receive it. That's what he's willing to do. Now I've got to get to my experience. Because you notice with Elijah, eventually, he says, the journey is coming. There is a journey. And you can't live at those stones. you got to get up eventually. Now, if you have a day where you sit by those stones and you just wail on them, go for it. 
but you can't just live next to those stones. I've had a recurring dream. Now we're in my experience. I've had a recurring dream for years, for years, that I go back to the house that I lived in in Fairland, and either I get to visit, or I stay, or I buy it, or they give it to me. <laughs> Sorry, that's fun. It's a big house. So they, wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. Um, or um, in one of them, one of them was so extreme that the house had been abandoned and we were like using squatter's rights in the basement. <laughs> to explain to you how often I've had this dream, even in my dreams, there's a narrative that continues. I remember other dreams in the dream. And I always have, as long as this has been going on. But this week, God gave me two. Two dreams. The reason I keep dreaming about this house, and I know this, is because that was where Dad wanted to die. That was Dad's retirement home. It was the last house we were ever going to build. It was the last house we were ever going to live in. We were supposed to stay there. But, and I got to be honest, I was not in Christ where I needed to be in that house. And neither was the rest of my family. That house wasn't good for us. It wasn't. It caused separation. It caused fighting. It caused isolation. It wasn't good for us. And so I always thought, only to me, right, never to anybody else, this was just my little thought, that one day after God had healed all of us, I was going to get to buy that house back and let dad go live there again. Thought that for years. Of course, it was a pipe dream. It's an, it's an expensive house. But I've thought that for years. And last night, well, not last night, whenever it was that I had a dream, I was back at that house. And it had been torn down to its very foundations. It was gone. How am I supposed to give it back to my dad now? He's not here. I love how God gives us emotions and dreams because I'm a very withdrawn person, but not in my dreams. I was beating the floor and screaming and wailing at the person that tore it down. How dare you do this? You're not allowed to tear this house down. I have to give it to my dad. And yet, even in the dream, the guy was saying, but look. Look on the other side of the house. And there was a Dollar General. I kid you not. <laughs> like, that is in no way exaggerated. There was a Dollar General on the other side of the house. I'm serious. Oh my goodness. Even in my dreams, they're popping up. <laughs> But the, I, anyway, the man who tore it down had built a highway. That's why it had to be torn down, see, because there was a highway that was built. And if you followed this highway, you got to Grove almost immediately. If any of you drive from here to Grove daily, that would be pretty nice. That would be pretty nice. You see... I'm the only one that's still obsessing over the house. God built a whole highway that is going to make everybody's life better. And I see the highway now. But that doesn't mean that I'm okay. 
and it doesn't have to. I noticed four stages with this, right? When that house gets torn down, some of us just don't see the highway. Not yet. At first, I didn't see the highway. That's okay if that's where you live right now. If you're like, I lost this person and I don't get it, that's okay. Because you're at that stage right now and you can sit there. Don't live there, but you can sit there and you can beat the ground and you can yell. You know who, you know who to the house down, right? You know who I was yelling at in that dream? It was God. I was screaming right at God in the face in my subconscious. There he was. Some of you see the highway. That doesn't mean you're okay with it. I still want that house. And the funny thing is, I don't even want it for me. I want it for him. (laughs) There's a big difference between seeing the highway and being okay. I think that this here is me finally going from seeing the highway but not being okay with it to seeing the highway and recognizing, you're right, this is going to be better. But that doesn't mean I'm okay with it. But here's the hope. Here's the hope. One day, one day, I'm going to be driving down that highway, and I'm going to go, this is better. That's not today for me, guys. That's not today. I'm not there. I don't see that this is better. But at least I have a promise and a warm blanket and some coffee that says, yes, but one day you will. The second dream, the house was still intact. See, What I mean, the Bible does that. It really does. Chapter 1 of Genesis and chapter 2 of Genesis tell the exact same story, just from a different perspective. Um, In the second dream, the house had not been torn down, and I got to go in. But a new family owned it now. I know the family that owns it, like real life. I know the family that owns that house. But they had been replaced by a new family. And I asked can we stay here? And they said, no. And I asked, can I visit? And they said, no. And I said, can we at least have Christmas here? And you guys, (laughs) Christmas means something to my family. I'm really not looking forward to Christmas this year. I'm really not. My dad played Christmas music all year long. He had a house or a room in each house we lived in that was dedicated to Christmas all the time. (laughs) I think one of the reasons he ate so bad is because he wanted to maintain the belly. I'm serious. So I'm not looking forward to Christmas. But I asked him, can I at least spend Christmas here? And they said, no. There comes a point where looking back at that house will destroy us. It will tear us into nothing. I hate to quote Harry Potter up here, but people waste away in front of the mirror of Erised, the mirror that shows you everything that you want. They just die there. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. God said, you don't get to stay in this house anymore. And you know, I totally believe I'll never dream about it again. Because God's word is done. I still miss my dad. I'm going to keep missing him. But I've been playing that banjo. And I even posted a, a, a short, like a, like a TikTok, of an old video that I did. I, I turned, took it from a video and made it into a TikTok. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, except on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, because I don't do TikTok. But, but um, and I, I felt okay with that. In fact, it was kind of nice. <coughs> Healing is coming. 
But I had to recognize where the pain was and face it at some point. So I'm going to keep playing that banjo. I'm not going to let... I'm not going to let my weakness stop me because I'm going to let God's strength grow me. And I'm going to keep driving down that highway. And every time I pass the pile of stones that was that house, that Ebenezer, I'll be like, yeah, I see you. I remember you. But I don't live there anymore. If you feel like this was for you, I really want you guys to come up here. Not because you're trying to be okay. Not because you're trying to get over it. Not because you're trying to forget or avoid. But because you know that all God wants to do right now with you is cover you with his wings. And this is the place where he can do that. And I am going to ask the leaders to pray for you, but I'm going to pray for you too. Because I'm in the boat with you. So while we play this last song, if you guys could come up and we'll pray for you. And we'll just let God cover you with his wings.